Welcome to Profit Central, everybody. It is good to be back. I hope that you have benefited from the study of the words of Isaiah. And this year, I want to focus on the words of Jeremiah. And I want to, again, liken these words to us, to our current situation, that we can learn and profit spiritually, and to understand better the context of the natural man, especially the religious man as many of us profess to be religious. So this will be a different format. I'm going to have a little bit of fun, do some different things, but I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. I first off want to talk about the name and the pronunciation of Jeremiah. In the Old Testament, we find his name or variations of his name 135 times in Hebrew. This name means God loosens or God exalts or raises up. Kind of two varying meanings. Not sure which one is more correct, but there are two variations here to understand. The first is on the left there, 124 times it appears as Yahu, and 11 times it is Yermeyah. The first one I mentioned appears 120 times in the book of Jeremiah and a few times in the book of Chronicles, but specifically in two chapters, 35 and 36 of 2 Chronicles. Now, the second variation, Yermeyah, appears only in two chapters of Jeremiah and also in Ezra and Daniel in later chapters, basically post-Babylonian conquest. So I am going to pronounce Jeremiah's name as Yermeyahu, throughout this video and throughout this series. Also know that three other times in the New Testament, appearing all in Matthew, and five mentions in the Book of Mormon, we see this name, Yirmeyahu. I've put it here in Paleo-Hebrew because this is what Yirmeyahu would have written and spoken in his time. But let's get into a little background on Yirmeyahu. He lived near Yerushalayim, or Jerusalem, only about two and a half miles out in a town called Anatot. This town was to the north, a little to the east, just two and a half miles. He came from the tribe of Lewi or Levi, which is significant because he was growing up as a temple priest. His ministry, not temple ministry, but ministry to Yahuwah, to God, was between 630 and 580 BC, more or less which was about 50 or more years after Yeshayahu or Isaiah. So it wasn't too long after that heritage. He was also preceded by Zephaniahu or Zephaniah, as we say. So he was used to this sort of prophetic rebellion against the people. If you have not listened to any of the Isaiah videos, go back and listen because it is all about standing up against the religious establishment, the mainstream worship. And we'll see how Jeremiah fits into this. I'm going to give you a little bit of a dramatized reading here of chapter one. So enjoy it. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Ah, my Lord Yahuwah, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee. Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms, to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build, and to plant. Yirmeyahu, what seest thou? I see a rod of an almond tree. Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my work to perform it. What seest thou? I see a seething pot. The face thereof is toward the north. Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, and they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Yehuda, 
and I will utter my judgments against them touching all their wickedness who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worshipped the works of their own hands. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Yehuda, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee to deliver thee. So now after a reading of the text, I want to break this down a little bit. Uh, some verses, verse by verse, starting in verse 5, talking about the ordination of Yirmiyahu as a prophet. Now I want to point out that Yahuwah knew Yirmiyahu before he was conceived on earth. And before Yirmiyahu was even born, he was sanctified and ordained to be a prophet unto the nations. He's not just a prophet to Yehuda or to Yisrael, but to the Gentiles, to the nations, plural. Compare this to John the Baptist, or who I will call Yahuhanan, who was deemed the greatest prophet in Matthew eleven eleven. So in Luke, I will read chapter 1, verse 15. Before I form thee in the belly, contrast with, for he shall be. It was speaking future. This in Yirmiyahu is speaking past tense. God says he knew Yirmiyahu, and for Yahuhanan, he was great in the sight of Yahuwah, is the parallel. If he's in God's sight, then God knows him. He's not hiding, right? Before thou camest forth out of the womb, parallels with Luke, even from his mother's womb. So the same mention of womb here. And I've highlighted in green, God says, I sanctified thee, Yermeahu, and I ordained thee. Parallels with Yehuhanan, he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Sanctification by the Holy Ghost. This is the ordination or the election. And lastly, in purple here, a prophet unto the nations parallels or expands on what we see in Luke, shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. This prophet is not going with the status quo or with the mainstream authority of his church of his time. Okay, the strong drink, going back to Isaiah chapter 28, where they were drunk on priesthood power, on that religious authority. Yirmiyahu is not going with that. He is a prophet unto the nations. Continuing to expand on this idea of existence before this life and being known to God, I want to read a couple verses. First Job chapter 38 verses 4 through 7. And then Ephesians chapter 1, 4 through 6. So Job says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Paralleling with Ephesians, it says, According as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So to point out here, Job poses the question, or God poses to Job, where was he? Let's ask ourselves, where were we? at and also before the creation of the world. And we get the answer in Ephesians. We were chosen in Christ. That's where we were. Now, also, who were the morning stars or sons of God mentioned in Job? The answer in Ephesians, they were adopted children by Jesus Christ. The sons of God, children of Christ. It's the same message, different wording. Another question, who is the cornerstone mentioned in Job? Well, we can learn 
in many verses I have put here. Psalms 118 verse 22, Isaiah 28 16, Matthew 21 42, Acts 4 10 through 12, Ephesians 2 20, 1 Peter 6 and 7. It's Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone and he is mentioned in Ephesians as being that God. Now, the reason for singing together and shouting for joy is mentioned in Job is answered in Ephesians. They or we should be holy and without blame before God in love, the good pleasure of his will, the glory of his grace, and made accepted in the beloved. That is the reason for singing together and shouting for joy. Does that not seem fair? Awesome. Let's keep going. So now dissecting verse six a little bit. Prophet is equated to speaking by Yirmiyahu as he responds, right? But he seems to be unaware and even resistant to his ordination that God says happened before, when he was even in the womb. Again, we compared to Yahuhanan, the Baptist, whose parents did know of his ordination, and he was seemingly raised with some degree of understanding of his duty to God. They were both of the tribe of Lewi, they had different upbringings though. So what does it mean that Yirmiyahu called himself a child as he kind of pushes back on God? Let's get a better understanding of Yirmiyahu's age and where he was at in life. First Samuel chapter 17 verses 33 says, And Shaul said to Dawid, Thou art not able to go against this Pelishtine, to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Here, youth in Hebrew is the word na'ar, same word that Yirmiyahu uses to describe himself. He is na'ar. Now in Numbers chapter 1 verse 3, we get a little more insight. From 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Yisrael, thou and Aharon shall number them by their armies. So Dawid couldn't fight because he was younger than 20, according to Torah. Dawid was a youth, younger than 20. Yirmiyahu had to be younger than 20 as well. Likely, he was noticeably younger because a 20-year-old man by that point has facial hair, he has stature, broader shoulders. So likely, Yirmiyahu was between the ages of 13 and 17. He was a teenager. Let's go through verses 7 and 8 a little bit. Yirmiyahu is encouraged by God to fulfill his ordination. Yahuwah doesn't care about how young Yirmiyahu is. He doesn't care if he's a teenager. He didn't care if others after and before were young. Yahuhanan filled his calling. Even as recent as Joseph Smith was only 14, maybe 15 or 16 years old by the time he was called of God. Yahuwah comforts Yirmiyahu in his fear also of speaking, right, being a prophet to these people who are much older than him. He's naturally going to resist when he's just a child, as he calls himself, having to speak to these grown-ups, these people who are mature, who know more than him. That could be fearful to a young man like this. So from what would Yirmiyahu be delivered by Yahuwah? Because this is part of the comforting. What are these people going to do to Yirmiyahu when he follows through with his calling and opens his mouth to speak the words that God gives him? Let's put ourselves in these shoes. What if we, as seemingly children, teenagers, received a call, undeniable, from God to go talk to these people and then God tells us that, oh, by the way, I'm going to deliver you, implying that these people are going to try to do something to you because you're my prophet. I think we would all be fearful. We would all be wondering what is going on. Is this really God? Is this really his word? You want me to stand up against my church leaders, against my parents, against the government officials, against anyone and everyone and tell them they're wrong? I'd also reverse the shoes and put us in the audience's shoes, right? We have this teenager, young man coming to us and speaking up, claiming that he's a prophet of God, maybe, 
Maybe he's not expressly stating, but he's claiming to speak the word of God and he's telling us we're wrong. How are we going to react and respond to that child, to that teenage boy? Now looking at verse nine, I want to compare this event of God changing Yirmiyahu's life, putting his word into his mouth, touching his lips, so to speak. In Isaiah chapter six, verses five through seven, we see that Isaiah confessed his uncleanliness and his sin before God. He was probably older than Yirmiyahu. He was likely an adult. Yirmiyahu was still a child. He was a youth. He probably didn't have this large amount of sin. And he, I mean, he was growing up as a temple priest, right? Being prepared, being groomed for this specific clean lifestyle to handle sacrificial worship. So Yashiyahu experienced God touching his mouth, laying this hot coal upon his lips. And God told him that his iniquity was taken away and his sin was purged. He was cleaned. Now also compare this to 2 Nephi chapter 32, verses 2 through 6. So this parallel of God putting forth his hand and touching the mouth of his servant. Nephi says, After ye had received the Holy Ghost, after God has touched you, ye could speak with the tongue of angels. God is doing something with his spirit giving you a voice. But how could ye speak with the tongue of angels, save it were by the Holy Ghost? Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. This is the cleansing nature of God's covenant. When he cleanses you, he puts a voice in you. Nephi says they speak the words of Christ. Now, comparing the confession of uncleanliness, Nephi says, if ye cannot understand them, these words, they will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock. Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in darkness. That is uncleanliness. Now, the flip side of the coin, being cleansed of iniquity. If you will enter in by the way, says Nephi, and receive the Holy Ghost, let God change you. Then this is the doctrine of Christ. God will show you all things that you should do and give you all things that you should say. Yirmiyahu is living the doctrine of Christ. He is giving his witness and testimony. He's receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost and speaking with the tongue of angels, speaking by the power of God with cleanliness. That is awesome. Going on to verse 10, digging through this a little bit, Yirmiyahu is mentioned to be set over the nations, as I mentioned, plural, and kingdoms with an S, plural. This phrase being set over is likened to specific and prominent figures of Israelite history. First, we'll look at Pharaoh setting Yosef or Joseph over the Egyptian kingdom. There's also Shaul setting Dawid over the Israelite nation. This equates to being given spiritual stewardship. And this is happening to Yirmiyahu as a teenage boy. He's being pronounced this sort of steward and king, if you will, over all the nations, over all the kingdoms. Looking at Doctrine and Covenants section 30, verses 1 through 3, this is talking about a man named David Whitmer, but it's interesting that the same name David or Dawid is here, like the king of Israel. Now God mentions that David feared man and did not rely on God for strength. His mind had been on the things of the earth more than on the things of God. He was also persuaded by those who God did not command to guide him. They were not spiritual stewards, if you will. Also comparing this to Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 20 through 30, Ezekiel says that you have thrust with side and with shoulder and pushed all the diseased with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. Talking to the unfaithful Israel. But what can we learn from this? David Whitmer had stewards set over him that he wasn't following. He was going after the things of the world. Ezekiel says that God will judge between fat cattle and between lean cattle. Now this is connecting to Yosef. We have two direct parallels to Dawid and Yosef. And also later in Ezekiel in verse 23, it says, God will set up a shepherd, even my servant Dawid, 
This is symbolic of this spiritual steward and king. Now, the part that I highlighted in purple to David Whitmer says, the ministry whereunto you have been called. And Ezekiel says, I will save my flock. They shall no more be a prey. This is talking about our stepping into the role of God calling us, offering us his covenant, his Holy Spirit, his words of eternal life. We need to hearken to them. We need to give in and submit to them. Put aside our will and our life to follow after God. So Yirmiyahu is compared to Yosef. He's compared to Dawid. He is this, in small part at least, type of a servant of God. Additionally, in verse 10, we see language that God uses to describe Yirmiyahu's ordination, or better yet, his mission in his ordination. And that is that he will root out, he will pull down, destroy, throw down, build, and plant. And this is the counterfeit kingdom of God and the authentic kingdom of God. Yirmiyahu was likened to Dawid, who was a shepherd, and even Yosef, who was a shepherd. And he has the duty of seeking to redeem Zion. Now let's compare this also to what the enemy does to Zion. Because some of these things seem very much like what an enemy does. To root out, pull down, destroy, throw down. That's what an enemy does, right? Looking at Doctrine and Covenants section 101 verses 51 through 62, this is a very important parable for us in the latter days. I've highlighted these words in red that say the enemy or enemies, and the words in blue are the verbs that the enemies perform. They are breaking down. They are destroying. They are wreaking havoc on the authentic Zion and kingdom of heaven. And they also cause the true servants and men of God to be afraid and to flee. And God confronts his servants and ask them, what is the cause of this great evil? Should they not have done even as God commanded them? Of course they should have. Yirmiyahu is doing what God commands. He is going forth, and he is going to perform his duty. But there are many in the last days that do not. They do not live up to the calling. Many fall asleep. Many cause the kingdom of heaven, known as Zion, to be infiltrated. Okay, now let's look at the highlights in yellow, green, and purple. Purple shows what the servants, which is highlighted in yellow, the rulers, should be doing, what God has commanded them to do. And green is what the Lord explicitly says about his kingdom. So going through the purple highlights, the servants of God plant. That's what Yirmiyahu gets. They build. Again, it matches Yirmiyahu. They set watchmen. Now that's not explicitly described here, but they also watch themselves and they see the enemy coming. They make ready and they keep the kingdom of heaven safe from the enemy, from breaking it down. And they work in tandem with God to save his kingdom. Now, since the enemy knowingly now has infiltrated Zion and the kingdom of heaven on earth. This is what else the servants have to do. They break down. That matches Yirmiyahu. They throw down. That matches. They scatter watchmen. That's a little different verbiage. But I think it's safe to say that these match Yirmiyahu's mission and duty very well. They do all things whatsoever God commands. They do not shirk from their responsibility, even though it may seem hard. And we are told that people will gather against us if we take the side of God and we set ourselves against the status quo and the mainstream established religion. It's going to happen. So going through the words of God, he says, go and gather together the residue of my servants and take all the strength of mine house, which are my warriors my young men, and they that are of middle age also among my servants, who are the strength of mine house. Go ye straightway unto the land of my vineyard and redeem my vineyard, for it is mine. I have bought it with money. Get ye straightway unto my land. I may come with the residue of mine house and possess the land. 
Go ye straightway and do all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and this shall be my seal and blessing upon you, a faithful and a wise steward, who obeys these commands, who courageously walks with the Lord and goes into seemingly enemy territory, but this is really God's territory that has been infiltrated and ransomed and corrupted. This is the duty of a servant of God. Call it a prophet. Call it a shepherd. Call it a priest. Whatever you want. A follower or disciple of Jesus Christ must engage in this work. Now that's not to say that God could have a different ordination for individuals. But one way or another, I believe it must tie to the overall purpose and fulfillment of prophecy. It may not be as a warrior, as this young man, or the strength of God's house in this parabolic physical sense, but it's going to fit in. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. Jesus Christ himself, as the perfect example of a servant and son of God, he says, think not that I am come to destroy. That's what an enemy does, is destroy. But so does a servant. At least it appears to be so to the enemies who are comfortable and, dare I say, polluting and illegally occupying the land of God. So Jesus did not come to destroy the law or the prophets, everything that God has said, everything that God has established. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill, to obey, and to live out every word, to not shirk from responsibility, to not twist and pollute and pervert the word of God, to not pretend and to be a hypocrite, but in truth to worship the Father in heaven. Now moving on to verse 11, we're going to talk about this almond tree branch that Yahuwah shows Yirmiyahu. Now, I think it's important to realize that Yirmiyahu undeniably recognizes what he is seeing in this vision. He knows immediately, does not hesitate to identify this as the branch of an almond tree. How would he know that it is an almond specifically? Could it have been the flowers? I showed an example of a fruited branch with the nuts growing on them. I don't think most of us would be able to identify this as almond, even with the, the flowers or the buds, because we aren't well acquainted with it. But Yirmiyahu was. Why was he well acquainted with an almond branch? Well, as I mentioned, he was from the tribe of Lewi. Let's read Numbers chapter 17, verses 6 through 8. And Moshe spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece, or a branch, for each prince one, according to their father's house. Even twelve rods, and the rod of Aharon was among their rods. Aharon was from the tribe of Lewi. And Moshe laid up the rods before Yahuwah in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow, Moshe went into the tabernacle of witness. And behold, the rod or branch of Aharon for the house of Lewi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. Imagine that overnight, a seemingly destitute branch breaks forth in buds and almonds. A process that should take months takes hours. That is a miracle. That is the power of God. And this is why Yemayahu recognizes it. He's from this heritage of Aharon or Lewi. He knows what the almond branch symbolizes. It is a very powerful symbol for him, for his tribe, for his duty and responsibility to God and his country. It's also significant to Yosef, I will mention, because in Genesis 43, 11, it says, Their father Yisrael said unto them, If it must be so now, do this. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels and carry down the man at present, the man being Yosef, their son and brother, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. Part of this gift, it was a local crop. It was something familiar to Yermayahu. It was religiously significant. Now check this out. I want to give you a few interesting facts about almonds today. Now almonds grown in the USA exceed production of all other countries combined. 
Believe it or not, the USA produces more almonds than all other countries of the world combined every year. The USA has approximately 380,000 acres, while Israel has 380 acres. They do grow and produce almonds commercially. And interestingly, there is a significance in these statistics of Israel and the United States of America. Israel has the highest yield per acre in the world for almond production. However, like I said, the USA has the greatest overall production. It has a thousand times more acres than Israel, but Israel produces about five times more per acre. They are topping statistics in the world of almonds. Take of it what you will. I think it's interesting and it's significant for us today. The United States of America being a Gentile nation, I believe these words can be and should be applied to us as well. These are not just for ancient Israelites in the year 600 BC. Continuing on the significance of the almond tree branch to Yirmiyahu and also the people of his time and consider it for ourselves. This connects to the rebellion that Israel naturally was inclined to, specifically rebellion against authority, God's authority, and Moshe, right? Numbers chapter 17, verses 9 through 10. And Moshe brought out all the rods from before Yahuwah unto all the children of Israel. And they looked and took every man his rod. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Bring Aharon's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels. This is why it was so memorable. This was a token. It was kept to remind Yisrael and all of the people that they should not rebel. Furthermore, it says, Thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me, that they die not. This was a token of salvation. After they saw this miracle, they did not dare as unclean people to get too close to the tabernacle, to the throne of God. Let's look at 2 Nephi chapter 3, verse 17 also, because Nephi was coming from this culture. And this gives us a little more insight into the significance of this branch. Yahuwah hath said, I will raise up a Moshe, and I will give power unto him in a rod, and I will give judgment unto him in writing. Yet I will not loose his tongue, that he shall speak much. For I will not make him mighty in speaking, but I will write unto him my law by the finger of mine own hand, and I will make a spokesman for him. So we can see that Yirmiyahu was being called as a spokesman. While Moshe was given the written law, there needs to be spoken law and spokesmen, servants of God, sanctified by the gift and power of the Holy Ghost, given God's word, put into them, just like Yirmiyahu, just like Yeshayahu, just like every servant of God since the beginning of time. And this rod represents the authority of God given to these spokesmen. It represents God's judgment. And it represents the covenant. And to remind us of what opposes the covenant, which is rebelling against this authority. To cease our murmurings and to be saved from death, spiritual death, possibly physical death. Would we rebel against a teenage boy like Yirmiyahu? Would we rebel against God if we ourselves were called as Yirmiyahu? I hope you can see how significant and important this vision is to Yirmiyahu and his duty to God. Because this almond branch symbolizes that he is given power and authority from God to be a spokesman or a prophet to speak, right, to these rebellious people of Yisrael. But he's not just called to be a prophet to Israel, He is called to be a prophet to all of the Gentiles, all the nations, us, you and I. So what does it mean? We really need to be considering these words for ourselves. So let's dissect verse 12 a little bit, where God affirms to Yirmiyahu that his assessment is correct and God promises to fulfill his word. So the word hasten in verse 12 is the Hebrew word shoked, and the word almond in Hebrew is shaked. They are the same three letters. Now, both of these words are derived from the word shakad, meaning to watch or 
to wake. So God is playing with words here as he's speaking to Yirmiyahu and saying that God himself is watching and is ready or is awake to fulfill his word. It's time. Let's read from 1 Nephi chapter 17 verses 41 through 43. And he did straighten them in the wilderness with his rod, for they hardened their hearts even as ye have, and Yahuwah straightened them because of their iniquity. So this rod, again, further shows God's power, God's authority, God's judgment. It is used to straighten the wayward, the rebellious, the hard of heart, and the iniquitous. Okay, I'm not going to read all of this, but it says here that the rod was used against those who did harden their hearts from time to time, and they did revile against Moshe and also against God. So let this be a reminder to us to consider who we are allied with. Are we allied with the mainstream, who we have been told and believe are the servants and prophets of God, who are part of the mainstream establishment, or are we paying enough attention and so in tune with God and his word that we can recognize those teenage boys or those outsiders like Yahuwah Hanan, the Baptist, who wasn't a church leader, but he was from the outside and he was the true servant. He was going against the church of his time. Moving forward to verse 13, Yirmeyahu is given the vision of a steaming pot facing the north. Now, this is very interesting because it's less clear as to what this is uh, compared to the almond branch. But I think with Yirmeyahu's successor, so to speak, Yehezekiel, or Ezekiel as we say, we get a better understanding because God shows us a little more insight into what this vision was representing. In Yehezekiel, Chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. I'll only read these highlighted parts, but feel free to pause and get better context here. There are men, religious men, gathering around the temple and saying, this city is the cauldron. This is the same word, seer, as the pot, right? These men, holy men, religious leaders are saying, this city, Yerushalayim, is the cauldron or the pot, and we be the flesh. Now, Yahuwah, God, is saying, Your slain, whom ye have laid in the midst of it, they are the flesh, and this city is the cauldron. He affirms that Yerushalayim is the pot, but the meat, the flesh boiling in the pot, is the spiritual dead, the members of the church, of the city, of the kingdom. Furthermore, I highlight here, this city shall not be your cauldron, neither shall ye be the flesh in the midst thereof. God is revoking their earthly authority that is feigned. And Yehezekiel, just like Yirmiyahu, just like Yeshayahu, just like numerous men, they have the true authority, but they are on the outside. They are the least expected. God is showing Yirmiyahu a symbolism of Yerushalayim, or basically the Jews, the church, the one true church of their day, that they are a boiling pot of dead flesh, spiritually dead. Some other notes to account for are that the word north in Hebrew is derived from tzafan, meaning to hide or to treasure up. Now this could possibly be a play on words also, like shakad, to watch and awake, saying that possibly out of hidden treasures comes wickedness upon God's people. We read in the year of Isaiah that the people of God were getting rich. And we'll see that Yirmiyahu reiterates these same sentiments. And these go back all the way to Hosea and to other, like Amos, other prophets before all of this war and destruction from Assyria to Syria to Babylon to Persia. There's a precedence long before of these servants of God speaking up. So God also says in verses 14 through 16 that he will call all the families of the north, also known as Yisrael, which is the northern kingdom after the kingdom split between north and south, Yehuda and Yisrael, with Ephraim being the chief of the north. 
So God is calling all of these families to come to Yerushalayim and sit down to listen to Yermeyahu tell them how wicked they are, that they have forsaken God and they've become idolatrous in their wealth. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine being that teenage boy and being told that he has to speak to these thousands of people, people much older than him. And this is probably a time of festivities because people don't usually go to Yerushalayim unless it's for one of the three specific feasts where they go to the temple to offer up their sacrifices. Imagine being in the families that come and they find this teenage boy just shouting at them, seemingly irate, telling everyone how wrong they are. Probably most people aren't going to listen to him. Imagining the responsibility put on Yermeyahu's shoulders to speak these words in a time of festivity and observance of God's law and to tell everyone that they are wrong. That's not going to go over well. I mean, it's clear to anyone. It's going to be quite an adventure for this young boy. I hope you have been able to put yourself in these shoes on both sides, both parties here. But finishing up verses 17 through 19, God throws Yirmeyahu into the pot, into Yerushalayim. Similar, as I said, to Hosea, to Amos, to Yashayahu. So Yirmeyahu, like the blossoming almond branch, is to watch and awaken to fulfill God's command, to be obedient. This is a very challenging and difficult task. I think anyone would say that today. Imagine God telling you that you need to go to General Conference, Salt Lake City, downtown, in April, and you need to stand on the wall and shout at everybody, tell them how wrong they are. Probably most everyone's just going to walk past, and in their thoughts, they're going to call you a lunatic. Are you going to think that you're listening to the wrong voice? How do you know that it's God's voice telling you. Imagine feeling discouraged in front of a big crowd, thousands of people coming to worship, coming to expect to hear these smooth, soft, sugary, sweet messages of the gospel. And outside you get this crazy, unknown person just telling you the most outrageous things couldn't be true. You would probably say, He's deceived. He's got a demon. How would we have known that Yirmeyahu was truly God's servant? God said to Yirmeyahu that he would be made into a defense city, iron pillar, and brazen walls against kings, princes, priests, all the best of the best, the most recognized people of their society. And he's just a kid. Now, Yerushalayim is the defense city that represents the kingdom of God. It literally has a wall built around it with the house of God, with the throne of God. But Yermiyahu is fortified just as this city is, literally and symbolically, as his servant to withstand the attacks that Yisrael is going to throw his way. Because while most people, a lot of people will probably ignore him and just write him off as some crazy person some are going to get upset and some are going to take action against him. And if you receive the same calling, it's going to happen to you. Jesus talks about this to his 12 disciples. It's going to happen to anybody that truthfully, nobly, courageously, and humbly follows after God and pursues his kingdom. So with that being said, I wrap up this video. This is a good start to hopefully what's going to be a very spiritually profitable year. I hope to learn a lot from going through these words. And I hope all of you listening and tuning in will get at least a portion that I'm getting out as I present these things to you, to the world, to anybody that God leads to this message to hopefully wake up and to repent and to receive the spirit of God to be changed and to hopefully enter into his kingdom because the time is coming that God will take back his kingdom. His servants will have to break down a lot of counterfeit church that is built up in his name. And it's going to hurt. It's going to be very difficult for all those who stay in the mainstream and love the mainstream and idolize the mainstream in their wealth, in their worship. 
but I hope you will stick with me through this year. I pray as usual that God may bless you all, that he may bless you with his spirit to guide you in all things. So until next time, see you in chapter two.